Uh, welcome everybody to this education session, Horizontal Jumps from Both Sides, organised by the New South Wales Joint Officials Committee. Now this session aims to explore the horizontal jumps from both an, a, a coach's and an official's perspective. Now my name is Darren Wender, I'm the Head of Coach and Volunteer Development at Little Athletics New South Wales. We have Mary Macaluso, who's the Athletics New South Wales Workforce Manager with us this evening. Daniel Warren, who's the Little Athletics New South Wales Volunteer Manager, is an apology. And we also have a few members of the Joint Officials, New South Wales Joint Officials Committee um, on this evening as well. And of course, our presenters, Neil Hinton and Matt Horsnell, who we really thank for all the work they've done on this in preparation and will do tonight. It's going to be a really interesting session. I know people enjoyed the, the, uh, the high jump from both sides session. And if you saw that, it was a really great one. And I'm sure this one will be uh, just as entertaining and informative this evening. But before passing over to Neil and Matt, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are all situated this evening. Um, I'm here out at Sydney Olympic Park at Little Athletes headquarters and it is on traditional Wongal land and I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us here today. Now in a moment I'm going to pass over to our two presenters Neil Hinton and Matt Horsnell to deliver this presentation. Now, Neil has an ex extensive experience in, in, as both an official and, and a coach at, at all levels of the sport. Um, he delivers education courses for both Little Athletics New South Wales and Athletics New South Wales, and he's a member of the New South Wales Joint Officials Committee. Now, Matt, Matt Horsnell has coached at all levels of the sport from Little Athletics right up to international, uh, including being the coach of Nicola Olislagas, who became the first Australian woman to break the two metre barrier in the high jump and then won a silver medal in the women's high jump at the Tokyo Olympics. Now I'll be popping back in now and again, but welcome Neil and Matt. Um, I'm gonna be popping over to Neil first, I think. Neil, where, where would you like to start, Neil? I uh, would just start with that first slide if you like, Darren. Uh, welcome everybody. I, I hope you'll get something out of it from both Matt and myself. Um, a great shot there of a long jumper that, um, yeah, as an official, I would have been more concerned with the takeoff and then I'd be looking at the, um, the landing. Uh, but I'm sure that Matt is looking at that picture from a different point of view. And he's, he's looking at where the arms are, where the legs are, and just admiring a great jump. Yeah, and the body, as a coach, we're trying to, keep the body centre of gravity like where it is there in the centre through the centre plane and not rotate too far forward. Because as soon as you rotate forward, the athlete, the centre of gravity drops and they tend to drop quicker onto the, onto the, into the sand. So that's a perfect jump. You want to stay up there as long as you can. And you're probably then looking for that uh, left leg to come through and yeah. join the right. Yeah, we look a little bit take off uh, the free knee driving up and then dropping slightly and then both legs uh, pulling through. We're with a lot of little kids and a, you know, a lot of beginners. I see they execute the first part of the jump with their arms and they're not up with the arms coming up and over the body. They're a little bit forward and straight into a landing and the glutes aren't fired off the takeoff and... Um, and actually teaching the right technique, there's less injuries, kids are running off the board, they're not blocking and their bodies uh, handle long jump and triple jump a lot better. So after that little intro, I'll just say that uh, the following slides, there's going to be quite a few rules. We'll rush through a lot of them to try and keep within the hour. But I will tell you that um, in the World Athletics rule book, uh, rule 29 and 30 cover long jump. There is a rule 31 that is specific to triple jump. And the same uh, rules apply in little a's and you can find those in the New South Wales Little Athletics Rules of Competition under rule 10. We'll go to the next slide. Thanks, Darren. Now, this is an area I think that... Um, we're there as an official for the athletes, and I think that Matt would agree that this is a very important part of competition um, in the fact that the athletes come down, it's a new environment for them from where they've warmed up at the warm-up track, and they want to get their run-ups right, they want to get some practice trials in, um, 
and as you can see there, there is actually no set procedure nor a set number of practice trials. Um, but it, it all comes down to that next sentence, the judges trying to coordinate uh, that period so that all athletes get a reasonable opportunity to uh, set their run-ups, warm up and practice. And what I see with officials, they really, that I've over the years coordinate that really well. You know, the, the, the athletes are controlled and they, um, you know, uh, and they're, you know, that I've never seen an issue once with a warm up with athletes that I've had, or uh, I take my hat off to most of the officials who, who run that process, you know. And during that process too, the, the pit has to be closed at times for the safety of the athlete so that uh, you can rake out any deep holes. And um, the bit that probably upsets most athletes, I think, during this period is when you say we're closing the pit permanently to prepare it for competition. And they, the yeah. number who say, oh, can't we have one more, one more? Yeah. And triple jump can be the, if we're talking that yet or later, the triple yeah, well, you can throw whatever you like in now, Matt. Yeah, in the warm-up, the different boards and different positions there can get a mm. bit trickier as well. We're moving from sort of 11, 13, and 9, and 7 it, it, with the various athletes. So that for warm-ups can get a little bit trickier sometimes. And it's also during this time too that um, you uh, let the athletes know uh, where the coaches' area are, which is pretty critical for some of the coaches yeah at local level comp really the coaches area could be anywhere but as matt knows from international competition that's where your seats are reserved yeah when you that keeps it more controlled and uh, mm. you have less issues where the coaches or parents are moving up to where the athletes are sitting and they're trying to relax and concentrate and not be distracted by people if you have an area that's designated. You, you have less problems like that, I think. Yeah. I think we can move on, Matt. Uh, Darren, sorry. Oh, we've, we've, we've actually I'll already got our first dog. questions. We've already got our first question. Where do okay, you prefer the coaching area to be? Um, I would say, I'll speak for Matt, I'd say he'd want it somewhere very close to the board. Most of the coaches like to be where, like siding the line, you know, where the takeoff is. So, mm. they, and they like to see the last four or five strides into the board. So, right, at, right in that area from the board, where just from the pit to that first four strides, I think in that area there is good. And there's another point we'll get to later, which is covered by Rule Eight Point Five: uh, the immediate oral protest and. That's where the coach would like to be very much involved in that. I know as an example, as uh, at the Sydney Track Classic, they put the coach's area where the pit is, but and they put the tent right where that, in line with the run up and, and uh, which was totally really difficult, you know, that usually the athletes are positioned back towards the start of their run ups in that middle area and it allows a big area for people to view things. So that, that was a bit of a hmm. up, up, I think, on the officials, you know, not the, the setting up of the of the area. So I don't know whether officials can can uh, alter that or whatever at the time, but um, that was that was an example of a bit of a and that became a really concentrated area, people trying to view and you can't view the run up and it became quite quite difficult. Um, just move on there. I agree with you totally, Matt. Um, yeah. At uh, times when I've coached, yeah, it, it is a problem. And also the official that likes to stand over the board and block the uh, uh, coach's view of the takeoff. Yeah. I'll put my hand up. I've done it sometimes. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, there was some coaches I didn't quite agree with and I'd... Uh, yeah, stand in their way. Yeah. Uh, so an athlete can use... <laughs> yeah, an athlete can use uh, one or two markers... Uh, during both triple and long jump. And those markers are placed beside the runway. Now, unlike throwing events, you're allowed to put your foot on the runway, on the lines that uh, mark the runway. So therefore that indicates that that line is a part of the runway. So beside the runway does not mean on that white line. 
Um, I think pretty much Matt, every athlete that I've uh, worked with that uh, is coached by Matt understands that. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of others who think that they can put those uh, markers actually on the runway line. Um, uh, that's all pretty straightforward. I, I, yeah. I think uh, when athletes are uh, brought into each, especially the major comps, that's addressed and and expressed to them anyway as a yeah that's correct you know as something to have to do um the bottom paragraph there no other markers are allowed once competition begins uh you will always come across the odd athlete who puts a shoe somewhere or a bag um that you know they're using as a marker and it's something as an official you uh, mm -hmm. you have to police because you're there for every athlete so you're there for the athlete who follows the rules and just has two markers mm -hmm. We'll move on, thanks, uh, Darren. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the athletes are drawn by lot. Um, when they come down, that's the order they will compete in. Chief judge or athlete controller keeps that in, in line. Um, and then you've got absence. So um, at low level competitions, that is an issue at times because athletes are in two or three events. Uh, the higher up you go, that is less likely to occur, although even at national level, you can get 100 metres com conflicting with um, a, a long jump event and so on. Um, the um, athlete who's away and they're called, uh, if they're not there, that trial is recorded as a pass. I think that's all straightforward, so let's move on with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... Little A, centre level and a lot of other competitions, three jumps is all the people are going to get. However, the higher up you go, you then start to have six trial competitions and um, that just explains how you go. It's the top eight who get the six extra trials. That's the leading top eight uh, from the first three rounds and then it's explanatory, I think, there if there's less than eight and or if there's more than eight. So we'll move on with that one, Darren. And remember, if there's any questions anyone would like to ask, um, please do so. If you want some clarification or some extension of some of the information, please pop that up in the chat box. As I said earlier, Rule 29, Rule 30 covers this stuff fairly well. I've, I've seen in some different competitions, Neil, where the, if there's less than eight competitors and, and a jumper might have three fouls that they've allowed them to. Yes, yeah, that's... Through. That's within the rules, Matt, that if yeah. there's less than eight, you can yeah. take everyone through to the um, to the final three jumps. Yeah. Um, however, if there's more than eight and, uh, say, nine athletes, but two of them have got three fouls each, you don't take either of them through. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, an athlete can pass, uh, sorry, when a trial begins, uh, it's usually when the uh, judge removes the cone on the runway in Australia. That's the um, protocol in Australia. And that usually happens once the pit is ready for the athlete to jump. So it's all nice and level, nice and safe. The cone, one of those orange cones, just um, closes the runway. I know in a lot of events, I see an official walk across and just hold their red flag out. But either way, it stops the athlete from coming in, but once the judge is gone or the cone is gone, it's usually when the trial starts and the higher level competition, it's very hard for an athlete to hear their name called from the recording table, uh, but there is an athlete controller back there with them trying to organize all of that. Very good, Darren. So an athlete can actually pass on any one of their trials, whether it's a three uh, jump comp or a six jump comp, um, but they must tell the recorder or the chief <coughs> that they are passing beforehand because once their name's called, if they decide then to pass, it becomes a foul. Uh, you also got a time limit on the jump. Um, now, the wording on that is that uh, providing you have started your run up before that minute has expired, you do not disallow the trial for that reason. Um, 
you've got a little rider down the bottom that the referee who um, in a lot of cases is just like God, they can determine that special circumstances apply and overrule uh, those time limits. I think we can move on, Darren. So there's the normal time limit. It uh, does not change like it does for, for high jump. So more than three athletes, one minute, two or three athletes, one minute. Uh, consecutive trials, they do get an extra minute and it's identical for the triple jump. And there is a yellow flag to raise um, when there's only 15 seconds left. Okay, so uh, David's just asked a question there, which is probably a good one. Uh, examples of where the referee can actually override that time. Um, perhaps the wind gauge blew over, fell across the track. Maybe a piece of rubbish came across and the athlete was waiting for that. Um, someone in the crowd may have thrown something. Um, anything that the referee feels that the athlete didn't have a fair go and had to delay the start of their trial because of that. I hope I that's did, answered I, your question, David. I did have a case with Bethany in the New South Wales Open where she completed the jump though and some uh, rubbish blew across in front of her as she was running in. And the official allowed, she, he gave her the option of uh, having another jump, but um, they, they wouldn't take my view of can we see what the other jump is and decide which one, but it had to be one or the other. That was a nice try, Matt. I was trying it. <laughs> um, no, you've got to keep trying, mate. It's yeah. all sports. You try and push the boundary of the rules as far as you can. Yeah, because that was Beth's uh, best jump anyway at the time. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> for those who don't know, we're talking about Beth, who's a member of um, my club, and I've known yeah. Beth since she was about eight years old. And what is she now, Matt? 23? 23, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah we'll move on from that one. Yeah. A yeah. little aside there. Oh, that's a good example of, you know, giving the options. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, it, I've been at uh, SOFAC... It was a relay event and a tennis ball rolled across, you know. And she so might have had that where she had to stop. Done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when a trial is actually completed, it's when the athlete has left the landing area hmm. as required by the rules. And we'll get to the rules, I think, might be the next slide. But hmm. if the athlete has left the landing area in accordance to the rules, a white flag is put up to indicate a valid trial. And after that, measurement is taken straight away. Move on, thanks, Darren. So leaving the, oh, that's a good one. We had feathers from a feather boa. <laughs> that's, that's good. Elizabeth Jones, I think it is. So, yeah, there's all sorts of things can happen. They um, are everywhere around at Sydney Olympic Park and we're <laughs> after that concert. So oh, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not surprised, Elizabeth. Uh, um, so... <laughs> For the foul, for sorry, for the jump to be um, valid, the athlete's first contact on leaving the landing area must be uh, a forward of the nearest break in the sand. And so, if you go forward, then you will get a white flag. Uh, it's the closest mark in the sand left by the athlete that you must make first contact with the border or the ground outside, forward of that not back closer to the takeoff line. Uh, and if an athlete doesn't comply with that, obviously a red flag goes up. And uh, the majority of judges don't really want to put up red flags. Matt probably disagrees with that. He sees too many of them, but... Yeah. What, what I've seen, or what I've done, if I'm raking as an official, say, I'll, and the athlete completes the jump, I'll, I'll uh, make it a point to stand behind or in an area that they have to go around me, not, not stand in the path where they'll, they avoid, you know, where it can be in the way where they might go backwards. Uh, uh, as an it's, official, it's a good thing to just move to where they have to go to outside of you and that have you have less problems then, especially, especially with younger kids. Too. Uh, definitely. Nines and tens, you move your body position to force them to go where you want them yeah, to go. Yeah, that's it. You, you're funneling yeah. them out the end. Um, and no one's ever told me that's assistance to an athlete if they're uh, yeah. doing it. So it's actually just teaching them to naturally yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, come what may, we're there for the athletes. So, yeah. Okay, Darren, we'll go on. 
Uh, so yeah, the white flag goes up. Um, if it's a valid jump and it's measured straight away and that re measurement is recorded on the result sheet, if the athlete fails to make a valid trial, it's recorded on the uh, result sheet as an X, not a P or an F or any other funny symbol, it is an X. And if an athlete decides to pass an event, it's recorded as a horizontal dash. And once again, not a P or any other funny little symbol. Thanks, Darren. So the measurement is taken from the nearest mark in the sand, made by any part of the body or anything that is attached to it. Um, you'll sort of hear some athletes at times when they're told that their hair uh, brush the sand well back before their actual landing point. Uh, you just explain to them, your hair is a part of your body and it certainly is attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's measured from the takeoff line or its extension. And it's always measured uh, parallel to the runway. And uh, that's why it mentions there the takeoff line extension because sometimes you have to measure from outside the actual takeoff line or the board because an athlete has jumped to one side of the pit. But um, once again, it is always taken parallel to the runway. Now, there's a difference in little a's from the sixes up to the under tens where they jump from the sand square. And the measurement is made from the mark in the sand to the mark in the pit. So it's not taken parallel, it is taken in the shortest measurement, which is straight from the mark in the, on the sand square to the closest mark in the actual landing area. Probably someone will ask on that one, but no, doesn't look like it. We'll move on with that one. Thanks, Darren. Um, so once again, we've got just a count back method to determine who comes first, second, third, or places all the way down. Um, and it, it goes back to their next best valid jump. Uh, if they're still tying after that, you just keep going back. Okay, Darren. Okay, so this is the latest update of the rules. It's been in for a little bit now. Uh, where it used to have the focus on putting a mark in plasticine boards and all the rest, it's now been taken to, um, while taking off, break the vertical plane of the takeoff line with any part of their foot slash shoe, where the running up without jumping or actually in the act of jumping. So we're now concerned with breaking a vertical plane. Any comments on that one, Matt? Yeah, it's a tricky rule, and um, one of the uh, when you when you uh, say with a, a an elite jumper and that you probably contact time on the ground is about 0 0.15, 0 0.18, you know seconds off that takeoff. So you got an official looking there at a 0.15 of a second to see whether if it's right on the line. And the other point of view that I see is some shoes are a little bit higher at the front and others are a little bit lower and papered. Others are higher and a bit square on the on the shoe. So if you contact the behind the line, you're right on it. It's like you got the toenail, um, you like one millimeter behind it. But if you rotate, if your shoe rotates as you come up with the toe off. It's going to appear that with a naked eye in that 0.15 of a second, it's over. Where in actual fact, unless unless you've got a high speed video, you can view that and that can be quite tricky to get that, you know. Because in the naked eye, it looks like it's very hard to see and it and it looks like it wrote, you know, rotates in the foot strike over the line. But no, I actually agree with everything that, yeah. everything Matt is saying there, I actually agree with. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I can say is that uh, once you remove an official looking at a plasticine board for one or yeah. two minutes, this looks much neater, but it's yeah. still got that issue of what Matt's saying about the style of, style of shoe, the speed yeah. that it all happens. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's um, yeah, placid scene may have not, you know, you would have had a fair jump on that probably, you know. That's yeah. Thing. Now, what, now, I'm going to throw it to you, Matt. Now you've got this new view proposal that um, yeah. uh, Matt brought up with me a few weeks ago. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's interesting. Put it that I've way. looked at it and uh, I've been to a few comps where the technology they had there to view the foot. So any protests, um, that come in, but the the technology is broken down half the time, and they couldn't get an image, you know. So for that, that makes it quite difficult. And the pressure on the official, you know, I I can totally understand how how can you possibly see that one is good, one isn't, and they're virtually can be the same. So my view that I personally have is that if it's that close, where you've got three officials going, oh geez, I don't know what is it, oh, I don't know, we'll foul it, you know, because we don't know rather than giving it to the athlete and it's that close you think okay give it to them what i would propose is that if it's right on and you don't know and it's um and it's not 100 percent you you take 30 millimeters off their jump and allow the jump to go ahead so if they jump their personal best and jump like katie had one in um in act chance and everyone in the crowd thought it was okay and even fred edda takes photos he sent a message he said, I, I saw that that was that was not a foul you know that sort of thing it creates a lot of tension so if you take 30 mil off that katie's jump was 638 he would have had a 635 it's still a pb and the athlete's happy and she's and the other people have been right on the board and they've given that jump to them okay they're still 30 mil ahead and if Katie wins well she's disadvantaged by 30 mil but she's got that jump in and, and because it was so close and so tight that it just allows that little bit of compensation and a little bit I mean you will never please everyone there'll be someone who doesn't like it but I think that's a bit of a fairer system and of course if they're over by a 10 mil or so it's still a foul you know it's to these calls that it's like gee I don't know and even with officials, you'll have one say, I've seen it, one, and I'll overrule them, and it's that close that one will put flag up and the chief will go, no, I think that's a jump. And it creates a lot of tension there. And if you have something in the system that's a little bit allows that flexibility, but you still allow the athlete to have that jump, it's uh, I think it's a benefit of the sport because uh, the athlete busts their gut all year and they finally get one that really hits it and takes off and they get it. And... The amount of athletes are here, geez, I did another one of those one millimeter fouls. I think it felt okay, and everyone else thought it was okay, but at least it gives you something that you could um, that you can work on that I think is a benefit. Now, yeah. there is a little bit of chat in the chat box there, yeah, um, yeah. a little we'll bit of comment. And, Go, uh, everybody, uh, let us know above, what you think. Um, but it's but above both. our pay grade to uh, make a decision on this one, but. And I noticed a couple of the chats there saying benefit of doubt goes to the athletes. Yeah, that that Not is how it should be. <laughs> but uh, we, I think both Matt and I have seen some officials that uh, but there is no benefit at, of the doubt. Um, they're more important than the athlete, unfortunately. You look at the competitions over the last... We've had over the last month, you've had of officials out there, 40, like little A, say, 40 mm. degrees, they're out there all day and... And they're exhausted, you know. I know a lot of the guys, and they're by the time if you're on the last long jump and this is the end of the day, and you're trying to concentrate and get that 100% right, you've been there since 8 a.m., you know, and that's 6 p.m., and it's going to be very difficult to get that 100%. Now, you do have yeah. some support from Janet and Stuart there, uh, there Matt. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth is saying, now just um, Elizabeth is saying that the new rule is in effect right up to the point of the loss of contact on the board so the shoe can roll through uh so it can include the roll through of the shoe i thought yeah, but, on uh, that, on uh, but the official sees that and the roll through actually mm, they're just looking for a line yep i mean it the is the of contact contact lead, I mean, line, but the the yeah. shoes in front so um yeah. i'll see that i mean yeah. The rule's actually been written i think for world athletics where they do actually have the technology to do well, this the, at the technology they were having lots of problems with diamond league with that rule when it first came yeah in. yeah so it's not yeah it's a tricky one yeah 
Oh, let's yeah. move on. We'll, we'll yeah, I don't the think it's, on that one. it hasn't <laughs> finalised yet. <laughs> well, you've created a talking point there, Matt. Well, there we go. Good. You've launched it off. Uh, that's what we're here for. Yeah, and I think you're, you're really trying to get the longest jump you can get with everyone, and it's fair, and the athlete competes it. And yeah. That um, creates a little plane in there that you can work through. Now, I mean, really, the only restriction in, in long jump is that um, there's a prohibition on somersaulting. Other than that, as Matt probably sees, there's so many athletes, different styles, just the way their arms hang in the air, that there's those who hang and those who use the sail technique, um, the way their legs come through. So there is actually no restrictions on your style, but providing you don't do a somersault as you're coming up the runway or do it as you're going through the air on after your takeoff. So. So you can't do a Blues Brothers type, you know, <laughs> multiples backward flips. And... I'm sure for that rule to be there, someone must have tried it once. <laughs> um, and the other rules there that uh, designate a failure, I think you can see those in rules 29 and 30 for long jump. Uh, we'll move on, Darren. Uh, triple jump, right? It's pretty much the same as long jump but you must take off from one foot only, whereas in long jump, there was no restriction on that, on how you actually take off uh, because it's not in the rule, so therefore it's not, not a rule. Um, but because it's a hop, you must take off on one foot, otherwise it's not going to be a hop. Uh, just like long jump, there is no somersaulting, and then the three phases of the triple jump must be hop, step, jump in that order. Any think else on that one, Matt? It's pretty I think, standard. No, I think uh, dragging a lot. Some athletes, yeah, okay, drag their toe on. like uh, they come out of the hop and drag that into the step. Which, I mean, technically, it's not good anyway. But yeah, I, I have seen athletes get fouled for that when that shouldn't be. I Should think. not be. I think it might be in the next slide from memory. We'll have a look, Darren. Does it does slow them down? <laughs> yeah. Nah. There, there you go. Um, I thought it was in there somewhere, but it's the yeah. sleeper leg. Yeah. Uh, as it comes through, um, it should not be a foul. Mm. Uh, yeah. Simple as. And as Matt's saying, really the athletes penalising themselves in a lot of ways. Yeah. But I have so, seen that where some officials and like people aren't quite sure of that when that happens, isn't it? Um, you're talking again, Matt, that 1.8 seconds or whatever. Yeah. that it all happened so quick yeah. and you are listening for three sounds, bang, 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 and then there's this extra sound thrown in yeah, there. It is, there's, yeah. there's a lot to concentrate on. Um, yeah. And I guess especially in little A's, the number of times I see hop, step, step, jump, mm. and I think people might at times interpret the sleeper leg as being that second step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things I'd like to, like I know with especially little A's when kids are new that when they're learning triple, if you see a kid that's a little bit landing on their toes, I've seen that before where they're, they're actually foot contact is on the ball of the foot and that can be quite unstable and that, that can lead to injury, you know, where they roll their ankle or whatever and that's sometimes worth, I know you're not allowed to coach or whatever, but addressing that where kids can get injured from that and it's like the, 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 they need to be flat-footed on that contact and bring the foot under the hips and running off but yeah from a coach yeah. point of view um, yeah it's always that fine line it's uh, like in high jump you can actually advise a kid to yeah. stop jumping until they go away and get coaching um and it's the same here because yeah. triple jump just destroys so many knees ankles even hips Especially when they're new to it, isn't it? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll go on with that. Uh, hmm. So international competition, uh, the men go off a 13-metre board, women go off 11-metre board in the triple jump. Other competitions, hey, domestic, all domestic competitions, you know, you can go off 5, 7, 9, um, 11 or 13. Hmm. We, we try to encourage people to actually participate in the event. So especially in little A's, no little A's are going to go off uh, 13 or 11. 
and uh, at a lot of um, club premiership meets, club level meets and so on, athletes aren't capable of, of making the pit on 13 metres, so they go off lesser build. And I think it's important too when conducting comps where the athlete might start off a nine metre board and they're transitioning, so they might do that and they're mm. able to redo their mark and advise that they can go back to an 11 metre board as they warmed up, had a few jumps in there. And that some kids will do that as they transition to an 11 as well. And yeah, actually, when I was allowing, a, uh, Yeah, just knowing that they're allowed to change their mm -hmm. marker and pull it back as they, as they go through in the competition. I actually spoke to one uh, athlete um, at Little A State and said, you do know that you're allowed to change the board that you're jumping off. Mm. And she actually did reply, yes. Um, so I left it at that. Mm. But everyone around could see that she was actually shortening her step yeah. so that she made the pit with her jump. And she was never yeah. going to get any better. And she was going off seven, should have been off the nine. Yeah. We, yeah. as a coach, or well, I don't do jumps very much, but I could see it. And I just asked a question because I didn't know whether she realised that she hadn't actually locked in going off the seven. She could actually change it. Hmm. Um, Janet and Stuart have made an interesting point there that Masters women like to use the five metre board, but it's not always available. So what, what does an official do if, you know, there is a risk of injury and there's only a seven metre board there, Neil and, and Matt? I mean, what, what, mm. what happens in that case if they would like to, an athlete would like a five metre board, but it's not actually there at, at, the, at the event? At the I've event. seen them do that. Unless it's actually yeah. specified in the competition yeah. entry conditions that they can't go off five, I'd, I'd be looking for some tape to put down tape, a tape yeah. board. I've seen them put tape down for that, especially mm. with um, athletes with a disability, not so much yep. triple, but yep. long, I'll put a one metre board in like that. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, long jump, the usual standard is is two metres. Yeah, the board could be between one and three, but it's yep. usually at two. But you have a lot of uh, young kids. Um, that two is just daunting. Uh, especially in multi-class. And so there's nothing wrong with bringing it back into to one metre. And uh, really, oh, you don't see too many one metre boards around at a lot of venues. Um, so, yeah, you put in tape. And the same with uh, if you're at a venue with no five metre board for triple. I've got no problem with putting a tape yeah. board in. You go overseas and three metre boards are pretty popular over there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, guys, admit, uh, guys yeah. mentioned that in, 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 uh, in the comments there. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. Neil, just um, when you mark out one, if you have to mark out one of these additional boards, do you need to mark out 20 centimetres with tape or do you just mark a foul line? How, what's, what, what's, I'd how, probably how, try how to mark the 20 centimetres if possible. Um, but sometimes on the uh, synthetic, it's very difficult to get tape to stick at times. So you're putting drawing pins down and trying to stretch it and do it. But mm. yeah, yeah. Um, if it's just a takeoff line, I think it's disadvantaging the athletes because they can't actually see what an athlete can see if they're going off a different board. Yeah. They've got a 20 centimetre board. Um, so I just think it makes it fair if you can get enough tape down to make it uh, 20 centimetres. And one, one of the interesting things I've um, come across that someone brought to my attention the other day with the new rule and the board is flat now, the takeoff area before it was slightly raised with plasticine mm -hmm. and, and it, it actually helped a lot of athletes steering and it, and it um, made a bit of a difference there and they've, there's a stat out I thought it was about 18% increase in fouls now with that new rule and it can be attributed to the athlete trying to pick up the board is because it's a flat area rather than a slightly raised and mm -hmm. introducing you know the other day at training, I put that in principle in the place where Bethany, your Wyong athlete, is having problems hitting the board and there's been, we put a towel down, slightly raised, raised it's, and she hit behind the line every time, didn't miss one. So I thought that was really interesting. Once again, as a coach, you're trying everything you can to uh, get the best yeah. out of your athlete. And, uh, and uh, if they're... They're tuned with that slightly raised board with a plasticine as a visual cue for when they jump in. It, 
it's something that we have to work around now and try and um, in competition to get that that right. Oh, it's just good you're getting it right for an athlete from the best club in the state. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on after that one, Darren. I don't think uh, they'll let me put the towel down at the competition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see it. <laughs> um, so an athlete can run outside the white lines that mark the runway. Uh, they can put their foot on the white line. They can actually run outside it. Um, they can take off before the takeoff board, board without being penalised. Uh, they can take off outside either end of that 20 centimetre board providing one part, and it's not specified how much you need to make contact with, of the shoe or the foot must touch the board. And um, oh, there's that one there about that sleeping yeah. leg. Right? Yeah, I knew yeah. I'd put it there somewhere. Yeah. But uh, does not specify in the rule what part or how much part of the shoe or the foot touches that board. Mm. So, um, you know, once again, it's usually probably a different sound the official hears if, if a foot or shoe has hit that uh, the takeoff board, mm. but it comes back down to that split second again that you talk about so much, Matt. Mm. Mm. So we'll go on. That one seems to be... Okay, this one here is uh, interesting one. It's covered in the World Athletics Rules under Rule 8.5, um, and it applies to 12s and up in little athletics. Um, the main issue, I think, with the immediate oral protest is when is that word immediate over? How soon after the jump and a red flag's gone up should that immediate oral protest be made? I know, Matt, you'd probably think about uh, as long as possible so you could have a chat to your athlete. Yeah. yeah. You're looking at how far the jump is, whether it's worth mm. uh, trying to get a protest in and have it measured be interesting with any stats if any protests have increased that with the new rule with the with the line you know has that created any extra where you had plasticine was more a physical and visual thing where now the new rule is without having video backup you know is has there been any increases in protests or anything or is it being yeah i can't answer that, that much yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, it is an interesting question because once the athlete had walked back past that board, looked down, yeah, there's a little mark in the plasticine board, and they think better of it and keep going. But yeah. now uh, there's no physical evidence; mm. it's purely the word of the official yeah. uh, that it was a foul. Uh, but we still. And in that know. case, it becomes the chief official who makes a decision if there's a protest on that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, to my mind, the you get you lose the right for that immediate oral protest once you've walked back past uh, the takeoff board or the recording table. Yeah. Uh, if you go back 20, 30 metres and have another chat to your coach or whatever, that's no longer immediate. Yeah. Um, and so it's also covered under that Rule 8.5, if there is a protest, what the official should actually do. Mm. Um, it could be ruled on straight away and uh, rejected or the referee or chief judge who's mm. de, uh, de facto referee in Australia um, can actually have that jump measured. Uh, the athlete doesn't know what it is. It's recorded on the back of the sheet or somewhere discreet uh, to be ruled on later. Mm. And, uh, yeah, look, I, I think every official has probably gone through the immediate oral protest uh, procedure at some stage and... Uh, um, I can't really think of uh, when it hasn't been adhered to as far as the rules go. Um, there be some that have been quite close at times, but I think yeah. generally it's applied pretty well in New South Wales. Because I've seen in the past where there is a protest and the, um, the uh, spectator provides the video evidence over the fence, you know, that's quite tricky as well, I think because it depends on angles and and that can be quite difficult situation yeah. to handle, you know, from a from an official point of view, isn't it? Yep. Um, I mean, the official is standing right on that line. Hmm. They've got the best view of anyone. 
uh, you, you're looking at probably metre, metre and a half back from the board. Uh, even the coaches aren't that close. Mm. The only one who has a better view is if there is a little GoPro mounted on the board. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I always find it difficult dealing with um, uh, a protest where a video is submitted. Mm. And uh, the first thing I actually ask for is um, if it's a three jump competition, I want to see a video of all three jumps because yeah. I don't know which one has been actually presented to me. You can get a time on it, you know, that. Yeah, yeah, that's the only thing that, that's the uh, only way. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. I've never done it or anything like that, but I've seen it happen before, and I thought quite difficult for the officials to handle that sometimes. Yeah, and quite often it's uh, the coach is uh, really adamant, so is the parents. The quality of the video isn't what uh, the latest technology. Uh, you're looking at a little tiny screen in a lot of cases. You're talking about and, two millimeters, yeah. Yeah. And actually, I think that's probably a, a good point at little A's where the referee can't view video evidence um, until it's gone to the jury of appeal. Yeah. And I think that just takes off a little bit of pressure on the, the referee in that case. Yeah. Rather than having a parent saying, well, look, 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 and jumping up and down and trying to thrust a camera in your face. And then my rule would come in perfect. Okay, well, given the jump, I would take 30 mil off and that... Yay, we're, back to that. we're going back to that. That's good. I like it. <laughs> uh, let's move on. <laughs> Another half hour talking about Matt's. Uh, I know. <laughs> so, I'll, um, I'll have to send it off to World Athletics. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, there's someone there called Michelle, um, not familiar with who that actually is, saying there was a number of protests at uh, Little A State. So, yeah. um, there you go. Yeah. And, uh, does happen. Yeah, I could see um, it would be an increase, but I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. So wind measurement does not affect the results. So it can be blowing a gale behind the athlete. If they win the event in, in a five metre per second uh, headwind or tailwind, sorry, um, they still win the competition. But the wind gauge and the wind reading uh, is there for the purpose of uh, qualification to higher levels and also for records. And um, the specifications is there that it's uh, 20 metres back from the takeoff line, uh, the wind gauge 1.22 metres high, two metres away from the runway, and it's operated for five seconds. And it says there from when the athlete uh, passes a relevant point, is 40 metres for long jump and 35 for triple, or if they run less distance. So the athlete who's run up is only 20. As soon as they start their run, that's when the wind gauge is operated from. And uh, for most qualifying meets, it's uh, anything over two metres per second tailwind. It makes that illegal as far as qualification or records go. Move on, Matt. Okay, Jeez, we're doing great here. Um, Open-ended question there. What what makes a good official? And I'm sure probably Matt and I will agree on a lot of these things. Um, to my mind, the first one is uh, good knowledge of the rules. Second one is um, you're there for the athletes and you do everything to ensure that the athletes get the best of competition. <coughs> Excuse me, best of competition. And I'll throw in a third one there, consistency. A lot of other things I could say, but I'll, I'll let Matt now throw in his. Yeah, I think um, fairness for all the athletes, like if, you know, you have disadvantage from different things and the official works towards everyone having an equal footing at the at the event, isn't it? And they're, mm. they're, they're quite good at making the athletes relaxed and, and, uh, and able to compete at their high level, but just by... Keeping them, um, yeah, just all. I think really keeping them organised and and having a a system where the the rules are in place that the athletes know that they're not allowed to run off and talk to the parents down the end, you know, and keeping them keeping them in an area and they, and that's the coaches' space where they talk to them, keeping that all under tech and the, uh, and keeping it as per. The rules are, but keeping it like nice and relaxed and open, 
I think is a good uh, a skill oh, that a lot of officials have. I guess you could sum that up with having some yeah. respect for the athletes. Yeah, yep. But keeping a firm hold, that's sort of being assertive, but having it in a relaxed manner is quite important, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that fairness to athletes and things, and we both know that uh, yeah. some athletes do their best to uh, put other athletes off. And, uh, yeah. Yep. yeah, if you can... Just keep a lid on that at times. Yeah, it just makes the event smoother, better, yeah, more enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's how it should be. It should be enjoyable for officials and for the athletes. Mm. Coaches, no, I don't consider them. So. Yeah, we're just a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hang over the fence too often with too many comments. <laughs> different when we're both at Mingara, but, uh, yeah, it's... Yeah. Different when we're on opposite sides of the fence at an athletics meet. Yeah. And I think with a, with coaches, you know, respecting officials is really important. So, and I think we're lucky in New South Wales to have such a high caliber of uh, officials over, over the years that I've known for 20 years with some of the yeah. friends I have there. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, oh, look, there's, there's one thing that's always sort of kept me coming back in that, and that is, uh, the athlete who comes up, shakes your hand at the end of the mm. event and thanks you for it. And the coaches that actually do exactly the same. Yeah. You know, comment on good competition. Yeah. Uh, that was just well run and so on. And, and I think that's not just me. I think it makes a lot of officials come back yeah. because you, you feel like you're appreciated. And as you say, you're out there from 8 o'clock till... Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of, one of the other rules that we uh, maybe haven't touched on is... I had an instance at Campbelltown where we were, I think might have been another event, Masters was on somewhere, or or we had the Campbelltown. It was a few, it was a little while ago, but we were lacking officials because so Nicole Bergman and I ended up we were raking the pit and 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 spiking for the so with the officials we had there, we were allowed to and we and what they did was um, pleaded with the other people on the other side of the fence that we could still coach, but we were doing a little hard work as well of raking. And I think I got about three blisters that day. <laughs> uh, good to see you've done some work. That's it. Yeah. Uh, but I know um, I've seen you, seen you rake at Little A's and uh, yeah. <laughs> pick up the bar at Little A's and that too. And the important thing up. is the, the officials opened it up. They were shorthanded. We helped out, but we were still able to perform our function and um, as coaches as well within the event. So they were kept that open. It wasn't all uh, yeah. strict. Otherwise, it wouldn't have had anyone raking. So. <laughs> but I think that's important too, like you always keep an open mind and have the event. The, it wasn't a major event, so it was like just a, a uh, Campbelltown um, drill or shield or something, I think. Yeah. Well, there you go. Ron is is taking credit for that decision there in the chat yeah, box. He's, there, he's Matt, well done, yeah. Ron. <laughs> Are there any other? We're, we're almost. Yeah, we should get over that, Ron. <laughs> now we are almost at the end of our session here. Are there any other questions that people would like to ask of Neil or Matt? It's been a very interesting session. So thanks for what you shared so far, Neil and Matt. Take take the time now if you'd like to pop something in the chat box. I will be stopping the recording soon for those people who are watching the recording but for those people who are live you get the chance to ask a live question um just something i might pop in while while people are um popping anything in the chat box there neil and matt um placement of matt board whatever for multi-class athletes does does the placement of that board because um some people have commented to me, you know, in the past that it's 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 it can be a little bit inconsistent. Does is 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 the mat supposed to be put right up against the, you know, the um, the pit? Is it supposed to be fifty centimeters back, like the younger kids at Little Athletics? Do you have any comments on that? Does does it change depending on on their class? And we've got some pretty experienced jumps officials on the chat box too, if you if you like to contribute to that. But Neil, any any comments on placement of the board or mat for the multi-class athletes? Yeah, well, there's there's nothing there that says that uh, you can't move it closer to the um, uh, the landing area. My personal opinion is it shouldn't be right on the edge of the landing area because if an athlete misses, they're going to hit their heels on that 
concrete edge of the landing area. They go so over. I like it back a little bit. Um, but yeah, um, I, there, there is, I think, an issue there with consistency. And a lot of it is uh, just the official's viewpoint. Um, yeah. All right. And there's just an answer for that one, Darren. And there's just some uh, chat in there about um, can an official let an athlete know where they're on the board? And I think um, uh, Ron's out, uh, answered that no, unless unless they're fouled. Mm. Is that right? So am I reading down here? Only if it's a foul? I've seen and it. if they um, ask? I've seen it. Um, they get feedback from the official when they're warming up. I've seen it uh, mm. just in the warm up, but not in the. Yeah, the, the rules say you can't give that assistance to, yeah. to an athlete during competition. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, especially at um, local competition, it's pretty informal in what you do during warm up. Yeah. And I know, I know if I think some of the athletes who haven't got anyone helping them, the, I've mm. seen the official will probably, uh, you know, have seen if they haven't got a coach, but I've seen yeah. a little bit of feedback for that just to say, uh, you know, just pull their finger up or whatever. But Barry could probably clarify Elizabeth Jones's comment there that the board should be one to three uh, metres. Um, that is World Para um, Athletics. Um, but if we're not at a World Para event, and we're at a local competition, I think you've got to respect the ability of the athlete and look after their safety. And there is one related to that. Elizabeth has asked, uh, multi-class long jump, can athletes have physical assistance? E.g., can a hand holding help, help, you know, can someone hold their hand to help them complete the jump? And is it still classed as a legal jump? Um, no. <laughs> you can... Uh, clap you can do all sorts of things to let the athlete know when they're going to take off but to actually um they've got to be positioned on the runway before they start their run up and uh, we're, we're talking principally here of blind athletes i guess um but yeah it's only sound that can be used to guide them and i suppose it depends on the level of competition if you're at your local little athletic center oh. you sort of can you know as you yeah. hold their hand but yeah we're talking yeah i mean uh, We've had people with cerebral palsy and uh, Down syndrome and their parents have run the whole 400 metres with them holding their hand. Um, there's nothing in the rules about it, but there you go. We've got to try and encourage people. So uh, I think at times you just be a little bit flexible. And look, we will have to be quick here because we have reached the top of the hour and we do want to respect people's time. But maybe one for you, Matt. We've got a question from Emily. What are the some, some things that we should be letting kids at little A's know about long jump? Any, any non-obvious? Non I mean, what do you like to teach kids, beginners, about long jump, Matt? Where do, where do yeah. you start? The big thing is um, running off the board, not not just blocking. So they um, their foot strike is under the hips and they run off and the free leg gets up and they're, and they're more vertical rather than what a lot of the younger kids just drop straight into a landing. So their arms tend to go forward instead of up and around. So they're keeping their body more central. But a lot of the times it's uh, their higher knees coming in and they're a bit taller and then they run off, the run off, teach them to run off the board with a contact with the dorsiflexion of the foot coming under and lifting through the hips. Yeah, we do a lot of work of glute activation and I see a lot of young kids that they have a lot of hip rotation so their glutes and growth issues that the glutes aren't functioning properly. So you can get a ball and roll that around. And and when they have that, they can get knee and ankle problems and shin problems because there's a lot of ro horizontal rotation instead of the glutes working um, up through the hips more vertically as they run. So that's a big thing we look for young kids. And I see that a lot, you know, the just... The kids sit down a lot, so their glutes just aren't switched on or anything, and they have a lot of issues. So, getting them to um, do uh, do exercises and and roll around on the ball can help that, you know, and, and release their hips. And then their running is based on them turn switching their glutes on, yeah. And then I think the one the uh, one you've left out there too, Matt, that I've I've watched you work often a lot often enough that. Uh, 
you quickly cut the 35 metre run ups down to uh, a more manageable distance. Yeah, we do a lot of pop ups and you just hold yeah. take off position. That's the first thing you learn. Then you add the landing in uh, after when you've learned to actually just pop up, hold the knee in the in the drive and have your upper body up, just getting used to that. Okay, no, th thanks for that, Matt. And thanks, thanks, Neil. And look, we, we have edged past the hour. So we, what I'll be doing to those people who are watching the the recording, I will be turning off the recording in a moment. But just while everybody is here, and, and Neil and Matt, thank you very much for your time this evening. The people who are on live can stay on if they like, but I'm going to switch the recording off in a moment. So Neil and Matt, appreciate all, all your time in, in putting this together and the excellent um, you know information that you've given across this thank evening. You. There was some comments in the chat box saying how, how good it was. So, so we really appreciate it. You're, uh, you're being here tonight, Neil and Matt. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Now, I'm just going to stop the recording for those people watching the recording. <laughs>